What's up, metalheads? Welcome to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast, where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Leave us your likes and comments. You can also leave likes and comments on our Facebook page. Follow us on iTunes and Spotify. Also, Instagram at talklouder underscore podcast and our website, talklouderpodcast.com. I'm Metal Dave, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster. And uh, today's guest is Tim Nibs Carter, the bass Fucking player for one the- of the coolest motherfuckers <laughs> ever. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. To finish hey, telling him who, who yeah. he is, Dave. Bass sorry. player, bass player for the Mighty Saxon, and uh, he's kind enough to join us. He's actually in California. Uh, we we found out that he's got a little rental place out there, so he spends a few months, a few weeks out of the year in California just for a change of pace. Um, so he was able to join us today. Uh, to bring us up to speed on Carpe Diem, the great new album from Saxon. If you haven't heard it, you need to do yourself a favor and get it. It's classic Saxon through and through. Uh, we picked his brain a little bit on uh, some things that he was doing before Saxon, which might surprise you. I know I was surprised. Um, he actually did a stint in Fastway and uh, did some studio work for Paul Diano and... Uh, so yeah, before he was uh, known as the bass player in sax, and he had some interesting stuff uh, going on musically, and uh, and he gives us a little bit of a, a bass lesson. We got to see him do some slapping and popping and all that good yeah, stuff. So, a, that was did, awesome. We got a free bass solo. He actually <laughs> yeah. picked up picked up a guitar and started playing some licks that he used lady for, in gray yeah, yeah he for played demos a song. for lady in gray on the new newest record yeah yeah um <laughs> the guy the guy is kind of a character yeah <laughs> um and then you know we the you know i i i've rubbed elbows with nibs a couple times not have had as deep conversations that we as we did with him today but the guy's super personal man um I love it that we've had not one but two members of Saxon on the Talk Louder podcast now, so that's a feather a feather in our cap. Yeah, um, I guess it's normal that if you have a hard rock induced uh, heavy metal podcast that you have, I don't know, a guy from Saxon, but two guys from Saxon at different times um, makes it makes me feel like it should be a contest in hard rock podcasting. <laughs> so I'm yeah, not, I don't see the scorecards yet, but yeah, I'm feeling yeah. pretty good about it. The Saxon camp has been very, very kind to us. And, uh, yeah. you know, we've had Nigel Glockler, the drummer on this podcast. And today we've got Nibs Carter and both guys, very personable, uh, uh, very fun personalities, a lot of fun to hang out with and talk to. And, uh, and uh and just i really just love picking their brains because you really get behind you know most people know saxon from the albums which is how most people consume a band you know you buy the product for lack of better term you listen to the music and you see the the videos or the photos but you don't really get to peel away the layers and get to know the person and uh that's one of the luxuries of the podcast we've been able to you know get yeah to know I, guy I, I, that's a good point falling in love with the music is a fan's job you yeah. Know, if, if it's talking to you, you're going to buy the record. You're going to listen to it in the car in the in the house and with your friends at parties, you know, and then you're all going to buy tickets and go to the show. That is the ritual. Yeah. Pretty much in that and goes in that order. Yeah. But <clears throat> nowadays, uh, by way of the podcast, um, there, cause there's many of things that have gone by way of the dodo bird that are involved with the ritual yeah. standing in line at the record store. Nowadays you just press a button and it's on your phone. Yeah, like, you don't well, even get a ticket a, stub anymore. It's a phone. It's a stereo. What the hell is it? You're walking around in your back pocket with, you know? Yeah. Uh, anyway, so the, the, you know, I think that, um, just being able to pick someone's brain and, talk about how they recorded the new record and then go down a total rabbit hole of gear and uh, and what the producer did with what they sent to them uh, and then how it comes back for you to like recut some of your tracks that eventually end up on the record is a little bit, which is very common now. And yeah. I, I think just you, your run-of-the-mill rock fan doesn't realize how kind of that is, you know, very normal now yeah so yeah. we really uh we really enjoyed 
this uh, this episode, and I uh, can't wait for everyone to check it out. Yeah, Nibs Carter on the Talk Louder podcast. <laughs> We live in Germany, and like this time of year is really like, like cold and wet, windy and grey. And so, I mean, we don't stay out here half the year or anything, but we just we just come out for like four or five weeks here and there, and it's it's just really like a booster, a pickup. Yeah, is, yeah, oh, very on, nice. California on. weather will do that. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and while I'm here, I just I get in, you know we have a family back in Germany and. When I'm here, I don't have to get so involved with the family, and so I can manage a lot more. Yeah, lighting, <laughs> yeah. composition, and stuff like that. So yeah. I'm writing and recording here, and sending stuff off to whoever I'm working with at the right. moment. Doing some stuff for myself, and I'm sending stuff off to Biffy for whatever Saxon want to do in in the next year or so. Yeah, and um, yeah. So um, it, you got a you got a new album out with Saxon Carpe Diem twenty third studio album. Um, but before we get to that, I had a couple questions I wanted to ask you leading up to the new album. Um, first of all, uh, forgive my ignorance, but I have to know what are the origins of your nickname? All right, so it came from Bram Tchaikovsky. Uh, his name is Peter Brammel, and uh, he's a Yorkshire man that was uh, a guitarist singer still is and uh he was a singer and a and guitarist in a band called the motors or what one of the guitarists with backing vocals and stuff the motors were around in the mid late 70s and yeah, a global band uh, they had a couple of hits with sarah smiles i think it was uh, airport and uh then bram pulled back from like being a full-time pro musician and enjoyed like just being the owner, co-owner of a studio in England, Lincolnshire, a place called the Chapel Studio. And uh, he, he was playing guitar in a part-time like semi-pro band called Dan Lino. And the singer from Dan Lino was from my hometown in Grimsby, which is only about 26 miles from that studio. And they needed a new bass player. So I got an audition and uh, I uh, got the job, and yeah, Bram said, "Yeah, you've got the gig. Cool." He left the studio, and we got ready and went to the pub. And he just said, "You should be Nibs." <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it was. It was. Uh, it seemed like a sensible thing to do. Like uh, you're either Timothy Carter. Or your nibs, and it's it's much easier to remember. Hmm. Um, it's it's uh, probably easy to forget as well. I don't know. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> well, anyway, it's a lot easier to sign autographs. That's a lot. Let's uh, put it that way. I wasn't thinking that at the time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, some people do. <laughs> <laughs> And so then I, I, I also realized, uh, and I did not know this, but uh, prior to joining Saxon, you were in uh, a version of Fastway with Fast Eddie Clark. And if I'm not mistaken, you recorded but are uncredited on the On Target record. Is, is all that correct? Mm -hmm. Well, it was actually at that studio before I joined Saxon. Um, I used to... Uh, I was in the band with Bram Tchaikovsky, Peter Brammel. <laughs> band was called Dan Lino, Paul Barrett. Uh, yeah, that uh, was some great, great, crazy times. But anyway, uh, Keith Newby was the singer, Paul Barrett, and uh, on drums, and Bram on guitar, myself on bass, and we just used to bash out our own stuff with a couple of couple of uh, covers like stuff from Sweet Jane, you know. Yeah. Um, and the, the house engineer at that studio, is he was like my age, a couple of years younger than myself, and I was only like uh, 19, 18, 19. I was probably 18. And um, 
Yeah, my mate Matthew Kemp. He was a he was just determined to get into uh, sound engineering, recording, and he was living in a, a town called Alford, which is about like five miles from the studio in South Thorsby. And he would like come over every day on his bike and just like do anything so that he could be like regarded as part of the studio personnel. Yeah. So he would be cleaning the channels on the desk, um, like uh, soldering cables and tidying up the main room and getting ready for any bands that might be coming into the studio. And I just loved it there. I, I, I would maybe do a gig with the band, Dan Lino, but never go home. I would just hang around the studio. And eventually Matthew and myself, we kind of formed a like very loosely – like uh, put together studio like a relationship bands it wasn't a band we would just record write delete record write arrange and just really enjoy being in a studio environment like yeah. 24 7 and uh, that that meant that every now and then a band would come in and I would still be there and so right. If they, furniture. <laughs> if they needed a bass player, then I was there. And, and that kind of developed into a semi-permanent, you know, it was just a part-time studio musician. So I would get a call, come in, do this and do that. And um, we knew that um, a band was coming up to the studio to record an album and I just stayed there uh, at the request of uh, the the manager and the um, and my friend Matthew, just in case they needed a bass player because they were going to do the bass themselves. Uh, between Eddie, uh, Lee Hart, who was singing and writing, and uh, the guitarist Christopher O'Shaughnessy, they were going to do the bass between themselves. They also had another bass player like engaged to come up for a couple of days, a guy called Neil Murray from like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Name. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, but I should stick around in case there were anything, anything that needed tidying up, so to speak. And yeah, they came, came up, got, we introduced, got introduced. Uh, immediately the fun started because I wasn't needed to record. So Eddie needed somebody to go drinking with or whatever. <laughs> And so I was employed in that position as well, <laughs> which was great. <laughs> Studio drinker. That's that's good work if you can find it. Yeah, yeah, it is. But it was great. We would take it elsewhere. We just didn't just stay in the studio. We would go bowling, golfing, pubbing, just stuff. And really good. You know, we got to know each other pretty good. And uh, Neil, Neil came up. Neil Murray came up and did his two days or a day and a half. And uh, they only kept one track from Neil, and the rest of it was um, myself on bass. Uh, so I, I was recorded. I recorded, I think, six tracks on that on Target album. Uh, I, I am credited with bass guitar, but you know, not as the sole performer because I wasn't. Neil, Neil recorded on a track called. Um, uh, what was it called? It's a, it's a pretty heavy, slow. Uh, I'll think of the name in a minute. But uh, then there was a guy called oh, who was playing the keyboards. The guy who was doing keyboards. He did a couple of tracks on keyboards, bass. So say let say there's ten tracks on there. I did six. Neil did one, and uh, keyboard player did the other, the remaining places with keyboards. Okay. There, there was an album after that, a couple of years later that they uh, said to me, you're going to do bass on the next album. And so I did the bass on the next album as well, which was called Bad, Bad Girls. Right, right. And I did all the bass on that. Okay. That, but, I'm, but I'm not credited for bass on that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I, I was well, this way, it, it was such a slippery production that my name fell off the album. <laughs> it slipped off the album. <laughs> We great, always, fun, great fun again great fun recording great bunch of guys and um, well great, great experience and historical years later, years later keep bumping into eddie in various different formats of 
uh, Fastway, you know, years later. I mean, we, we did last Eddie's last tour. Yeah. He came out with Saxon, uh, with Fastway. It was um, Steve Strange, our late uh, booking agent who died only like three months ago. Yeah. Um, Pat, uh, John McManus on the bass. Mama's Boys. Yeah. 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 Uh, Eddie on guitar. I mean, uh, Toby Jepson singing. And uh, Eddie would get up and do Ace of Spades with us every night. Oh, nice. Oh, it was nice. crazy. Absolutely yeah. crazy. And that, that was Eddie's last set of gigs. So yeah. uh, a, a funny association in, in the early days, but, you know, in the end, I, I think it was funny for Ed to see, you know, this, this kid that was on two of his albums from like yeah. 86, 87, 89 or what have you, turning up again years later or sharing the stage. It was re- really cool. I had some great, great times with Eddie. Um, yeah, I think, I think everybody's had some great times with Eddie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you also work with Paul Diano at one point? Uh, yeah, but that was just purely a, uh, a session, you know, j- just recording bass and not being in the room with Paul or anything like that. But years later, I can remember being involved with uh, Fastway Loosely again, and uh, uh, I was at the studio recording some bass in Finsbury Park in London, and uh, Lee uh, and Chris, the re- recording guitarist and singer, they they uh, said, we're going to get everybody down and do backing vocals. And you could do some filming, Nibs, some documentary filming. If anybody knocks on the door, just open it, let them in, blah, blah, blah. You know, instead of saying we're recording, you know, nobody. There was no other personnel there. So I would open the door every now and then and let the girls school in or, or – wow. Uh, not Paul Samson or something like that, but yeah. it was really funny. Uh, Deanna opened the door. Uh, I opened the do- door for Paul, and he was coming in, and he said, I am Paul. And I was like, oh, Paul Samson. And he, 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 did, he didn't <laughs> like that. I bet. Like that. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, but, but it's okay. It brings you down to earth, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. 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 But uh, that wasn't the intention. I was just, like, not aware of what Paul looked like. And uh, <laughs> Totally green, and uh, green feeling a bit sick after that as well. But he was he was dead cool, dead cool, you know. Straight after that, we're like, oh right, cool. this is what's going on here. It's no, no worries, mate. And yeah, um, but no, I've, I've, when you record stuff, sometimes it ends up on one album or another album. You don't often know which building you recorded it in, or when, or with whom. Stuff stuff so, sometimes gets recycled right mm-hmm. right used but that's what you you know you, you you turn up you do your play your bass and get paid and that's it whatever happens after that you know yeah yeah well, so it sounds th- like a good it sounds like a good place to be in your late teen years mm-hmm. uh no matter what whether okay. you were getting to play your bass or open the yeah. door for paul diano or yeah yeah yeah, yeah that was, and that was a little bit later. I was, yeah, you know, at that point I was still doing session stuff, but that by that point I was probably just out of my teens, twenty-one or something like that. Yeah. So it's tell historical. us about the tell us about the Saxon audition because uh, you were you were pretty young at that point. And by the way, you've been with Saxon now since about eighty-eight or eighty-nine. I don't know that a lot of people realize how long you've been in the band. You've been in the yeah, band a gonna, very, very long time. I was going to bring that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that, that was it. Wasn't an audition as such. It was again uh, session work at the at the Chapel Studio. Uh, I was in my hometown with some buddies. I uh, had a good, I don't know, night out or what have you, staying over at one of my friends. And I can remember we actually went to the pub and we were like sitting there reading the newspaper or something. And the, the barman come over and said, Are you Tim Carter? Uh, or I don't know, I can't remember that clearly. And um, But, you know, uh, the studio located me in a pub. And, um, and I was speaking to Andy Dransfield, the studio manager, and he says, Saxon are in the studio. Uh, they need someone to, to help with running through material 
that just got rid or uh, retired um, one bass player and drummer after the Destiny tour. And, uh, and that was like autumn 1988, November. And uh, so fast forward, I get uh, Andy comes and picks me up. I wasn't driving at that point. And uh, back to the chapel studio and uh, introduced to the guys. I'd met them a few times before because they would use the chapel studio for demoing and uh, pre-production and rehearsing and stuff like that. And so I, occasionally I might make Nigel Gockler a cup of tea or something. And, and, and actually that, brand, that band with Bram that I was talking about, uh, Bram Tchaikovsky, um, we would do the our semi-pro stuff, but we would also go out and do blues and, and country and western. Uh, we, were, we were called the Knee Tremblers. And, I like um, it. <laughs> yeah, we liked it. And um, and when Saxon were around in the studio, uh, Quinny was just eager to just join in and play guitar with anybody and everybody. And so he would join us on stage every now and then, just playing some blues standards. Wow. Which uh, which was a big deal for me, you know, because I used to buy I, the, the first singles I ever bought was. Um, a whole lot of rosy life and uh, seven four seven strangers in the night on the same yeah. day. Wow! You know, in nineteen eighty, and it's like uh, seven years later, six seven years later, six probably yeah, around eighty six, eighty seven. I was joined on stage with Quint by Paul Quint in a blues band. It was like yeah. wow, crazy stuff. But anyway, yeah, um, jump forward to eighty eight. Not that much later. They oh. needed a bass player, and I was, like, thrown in at the deep end to run through some uh, stuff that they were running up to record. And, uh, yeah, we, we got through that really quickly and uh, stayed over one more night, didn't really need to do anything the next day, and Biff said, well done. Would you like to get together with us to um, record the next studio album, which ended up being Solid Ball of Rock. Um, that, that obviously, obviously, I said, yeah. And yeah. Um, that went into, like, this was December, November 88. And so by the time we got into, like, March 89, they decided, uh, let's get a couple of gigs, see what it's like with Nibs. And, uh, yeah, we played a couple of gigs in England, just like one, like, thousand capacity nightclub and then more of a sports hall, two and a half thousand or something. And they went great. Uh, no, no, no worries. Straightforward. No, no hitch up. No, 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 no problems. And yeah. Uh, then we would get together and, you know, just like throw in ideas for solid ball of rock. You know, who's got idea for that a guitar riff there, a guitar riff there. And, yeah, that, so it wasn't really an audition. I, okay. suppose, I suppose it was an audition, but it was a working audition, if you know what I mean. Do you remember the, you, you know, you said your first gig was was fairly small by Saxon standards, but do you mm -hmm. remember the first major, because that's a pretty big leap for, for you, I imagine, going yeah, from... Yeah, well, you, uh, that, that was, uh, yeah, let's say 800,000, a uh, place called Buckley, Tivoli which is uh, just in Wales, I believe, just close to the border. And then uh, next day we played in Reading, uh, a place called the River Mead. It's a kind of like a leisure uh, sport facility, basketball or whatever. But you can probably get a couple of two and a half thousand in there or something like that. Yeah. So that was quite a big deal for me. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but then... I would say that was around late spring or, or, or let's say springtime 89. And then by the time it got to winter 89, um, we were invited to join Manowar on um, a small tour around like uh, they, they were going to tour. I think they were touring Europe, but Saxon were added as a special guest for like eight or nine um, of these shows. In Germany, I think I think it was only Germany actually that we were on, 
but they were like I don't know three, four, five thousand, something like that. But it wasn't really so much the amount of people; it was the it was the buzz because it was it was uh, wasn't just Manowar and Saxon; it was Sabat, uh, Fate's Warning, Lizzie Borden, Saxon, special okay. guest Manowar. Yeah. So there was quite a buzz going around. Yeah, cool. yeah, and uh, uh, and. I don't know. We seem to really like uh, tear the place up every night. The crowd were going mental, yeah. um, and to the point where we would come off and go to the dressing room, and you could hear the crowd still chanting Saxon. Yeah, you know, right up till Manowar coming on, which was probably a bit of a buzzkill well, for Manowar. <laughs> intimidating. <laughs> No, it's great though because they thrive on that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. yeah. You know that 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 you'd hear the crowd shouting that kind of shit, and like they just walk on like this. Yeah. <laughs> All Scott, good bands rise to the occasion, right? Yeah, uh, Scott on the drums with two huge dildos, like. <laughs> if anything, it pumped those guys up and made them made them play, you know, harder and faster than they. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that, that that was that was a fairly big deal, but uh, but I don't know. I think being around such uh, level-headed guys like Saxon, you, you know, you're not. We I didn't ever get the feeling like I should raise my ego game, if you know what I mean. Yeah. If if anything, it was like you know, lower it. <laughs> it would uh, reassure me that I didn't have to change anything. So. Yeah. That was really good. Just keep practicing, playing good, and uh, then that's all you need to do. And 35, 40 years later, here you are. So you must be doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great, great uh, story from, you know, I like I like the part where we were all three kind of realizing, as you were saying it, even even yourself, when you were... It's like, yeah, I mean, I bought these singles at the record shop in 1980, and six years later, I'm in the studio with these guys, and a couple of years later, I'm on tour with these guys. Yeah, it's that funny. is like a snap of time. That yeah, is fast. And, and it's funny. I, I, I mentioned that uh, a couple of guys had just been retired from the band, Paul Johnson and Nigel Durham, the bassist and the drummer. Mm -hmm. They'd only joined the band like two years before. You know, yeah. Steve, Nigel Glockler decided he, uh, he needed a break. Steve Dawson also. And that was around 86. Mm. And uh, that was the Saxon I knew. Oh, right. yeah, me too. I mean, I mean, I knew Saxon, like, from the very early days with Pete Gill on the drums. Oh, yeah, me too. Uh, with uh, uh, Graham, in, my, Graham in my mind's eye, though. I'm in, the, in my mind's eye. Um, you know, it was all Graham, Oliver, Paul, uh, Biff, uh, Pete Graham. Gill, Pete Gill, and um, Dobby, and Dobby, and it was like that was the, just the image. I mean, when I would buy a single, apart from the first one, uh, which was seven four seven, everything after that, like uh, the bands played on twenty thousand feet, heavy metal thunder, these were all like uh, seven inch singles, and on the cover it would be a live shot of the band, like with their feet on the wedges, you know, like, wow, you know, just, you know, uh, enjoying being on stage in front of a crowd. Like, yeah. and uh, they were, th those pictures, they really stick in your mind, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah. you know, when you're 14 and you, you, you fumbling around on a, on a guitar or, or, or whatever you're trying to play. I was also really interested in drums. Um, and, um, you know, you, you didn't have any video. I didn't have any video. And I'd certainly never seen Saxon on TV. I don't know if I'd seen any bands on TV apart from maybe Ario Speedwagon or something. Mm. Uh, you know, I used to watch a program called Top of the Pops, yeah, an awesome. English production. Yeah. And, and, you know, it was about 50 50 you would have the band in the studio or with the studio audience. And it would be, they weren't playing, you know, they were like, it was, it was lip sync, miming, yeah. playback, whatever you want to call it. 
you know, with plastic symbols so they don't make any noise and all that kind of stuff. And I never saw Saxon on there. Yeah. And I just didn't uh, see them on there. And if, if they were on, I missed it. And uh, so I was like, like left with this image of, you know, that's what Saxon looked like. It looks amazing. Uh, you know, I, I, I used to see like Graham Oliver's face all the time, a little bit like, uh, a little bit like Rudolf Schenker, this like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all, all, all the time. And, uh, that gave me the impression that he must be the one playing these like outrageous melodic squealing psycho solos. Right. And, but it wasn't, it was the other way around. Quinny would be doing all these like super melodic solos with like really unorthodox bending and stuff like, like that. But look like the serene character. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was the other way around. And like, and, um, it's funny. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal, you know, seeing seeing a band uh, in video or on stage. Uh, I didn't get to see them on stage until uh, about 85, I think it was. So that was actually an invite from being at the studio. Yeah. The studio, they were in rehearsing. Are you going to come and see us in a couple of days? So we would go to Lincoln Ritz Theatre or something and watch Saxon. It was like... Uh, that was the first time I saw them play. Wow. Yeah. Man, there's a lot to be said for hanging around a studio. Yeah. <laughs> You've had a lot of doors open because you were hanging around That's that right. studio. That's right. Um, <laughs> but it's good. It tempers you as well for when you do bump into the guys in, 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 a, in a professional like sense. Yeah. Then you, 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 I've said it before. It was a great training uh, yeah. for me yeah. to be able to get involved with your heroes and not, you know, fumble. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Carpe Diem. I want to talk about your new album um, and, and some other things as well, but uh, tell us a little bit about Carpe Diem. Uh, we're, I know, you know, the, the album was delayed a little bit because of COVID, but when you finally got around to doing the record, were there any songs on the album that you, that you found particularly challenging or any songs on the album that you're particularly proud of? Point out your highlights for us. Uh, well, um, I think uh, probably the song Pilgrimage was a bit of a challenge. There's eight of the tracks I was super directly involved in, in the composing and arranging. And, you know, I put the demos together for, for I don't know, let's say 11 tracks we kept eight of them just Carpe Diem and Pilgrimage we came up with later on in the writing and so eight of the tracks I, 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 I could wake up and play them you know off the bat kind of thing we even used my demos like Nigel drummed to my guitars and bass basically wow I sent my demos to uh, uh, the drumming sessions in it was close to Hildesheim, and uh, they were loaded into like uh, our recording engineer Jackie Lehman's uh, recording system. You know, they kept my tempos, my guide guitars, my guide bass, and Nigel played drums on that. In fact, I've got versions of the songs with all of my guitars and just Nigel's drums, and that that sounds pretty interesting. Wow, yeah. and and, and uh, nothing like what it ended up being. Right, but, yeah. But all the arrangements are there. All the arrangements are there, and uh, all of the parts are there. The only thing that goes on top of that is maybe some harmony, and of course, uh, what we call uh, noise tracks, or, or you know, as far as guitars go, noisy guitars and overdubs, and of course the solos. But like challenge, so eight of those tracks weren't really a challenge. Uh, because I knew them back, backwards, forwards. But right. then when we came to like the final like uh, uh, group uh, writing session, um, Paul had basically like the verse <coughs> of, um, excuse me, yeah, pilgrimage. And then after that, it was just a case of coming up with verses. Uh, 
I think he had the verses and like the intro and like that. You can pretty much build a track around that guitar figure that Paul had, you know, very similar to Crusader Hell's Bells kind of format. And Biff just really needed more a vehicle between and before and after the uh, riff. So that arrangement came around pretty quickly, but it was uh, – and Carpe Diem, we, we threw that together pretty quick on top of a riff that Paul already had. Nigel and Dougie went home because we were in Brighton after dinner. Then Biff and Paul and myself went back to the studio with some wine and cocktails and finished Carpe Diem off, uh, the writing of it, very quickly. Me on drums, Biff on bass, Paul on guitar, just throwing – ideas in and you, you can hear the energy on that track it's pretty uh pretty um it's like a really early style saxon song yeah, yeah. you know you, you see, take it or leave it from us as far as you know we just th- threw it together and it it, it it stuck so to speak on and, and remained on on the, on the record and it's got a really nice uh like uh immediate energy to it yeah. uh, the challenge for me uh, with pilgrimage was or uh, um it's such a classic style that uh was to like play it class uh, in, in a classic style way um I, I, I don't know just to hold back and mm. I, I, I did all the bass at home uh on my own no produ- no production um assistance or anything like that i i got rick and i got biff's rick and back a bass at home in germany and it's funny my demos had gone to a studio they were drummed on and then those drums and demos were then sent to andy sneak's place mm-hmm. so paul and doug would be uh arriving at um andy's place Together, separately, individually. I think they did it individually, actually. Where, where's, oh, An- where's Andy's place? It, he's in uh, – it's very close to Derby. Okay. Um, in, uh, yeah, Derbyshire. Okay. And, uh, and uh, yeah, beautiful countryside, like uh, dry stone walls everywhere, looking down into a vale. And uh, – so they would do the guitars on top of – on those demos, and then they would get sent back to me. So it went from me to a drum studio to Andy's studio and then back to me, and then I would do the bass. Yeah. But I was doing it on my own. So that that was quite a challenge because you've got to be technically, like, um, proficient and then not just in the, in the performance, but actually in – I recorded it actually on this thing. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, that's a laptop. Yeah, that's a laptop. <laughs> try, try again. Yeah, yeah. And this is actually my recording studio in Santa Clarita. There, that's a guitar. Yeah, yeah. There's a bass. Okay. Uh, that's what you can hear in the background. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is. Uh, David Brent live on the road. There's, okay. a There's a keyboard that I do the drums with, and okay. microphone that I pretend to do vocal melodies with. <laughs> so you're you're using uh, some software on your laptop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and so yeah, that got sent back to me, and I, I might sit down. Well, I'm, I'm used to doing bass, you know, that's what yeah. I do. But but to do it on your on your own for an album. Without anybody saying you're a little bit out of tune, uh, you're you're a little bit late. You're too ahead of the groove, you know. Right. That yeah, was, without that somebody, was pro- without somebody producing you, without yeah. someone looking over your shoulder, just double check, you know, quality control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you guys, that, that, that was a challenge, but it it, it it worked out good. Obviously, it gets it goes through quality control. Yeah, but, you know, I, I think you know I was very pleased with what you know I sent off to Andy and uh, the only thing Andy and I discussed after that was just the EQ on the bass, the sound, you know, and after that, it's, it's that's his forte. Right. If he's happy with the performance, then that, that's it for me. He just so you it. didn't, you didn't mic up any cabinets or amps. You just used a direct input and some kind of, uh, 
I was direct into, um, you know, uh, this thing. It's just uh, like an interface. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a Rickenbacker base, so I was plugged into two separate channels. You know, so you could so you can balance the uh, pickups. Yeah. Yeah, you can balance the pickups after it's been recorded, which is a neat little thing that that can really help when you're going from one track one song to another song and you know if you if you if you've got a, a dual pickup instrument uh, and then you're just left with the balance that the, the musician chose sure, uh, sure you know when you're the mixing engineer you're just left with that's the bass you can send the, the clean signal back to another amplifier and move things around yeah but when you can just move the rear or the or the uh, front pickup levels that can uh, sometimes be all that you need to do. Do you, do you know if? Uh, sorry to go down a rabbit hole of gear of how you record it, but I think it's interesting because of uh, you know the geographical distance and easier for you probably just to make the record that way for obvious reasons should be. Um, yeah. I think I find it very interesting that. You know, you don't need to go into a big, nice, expensive studio just to cut your bass tracks. Well, my house was expensive, <laughs> and it's nice. I didn't, I didn't mean to. You know, <laughs> I'm joking. But the but but yeah, I mean, do you feel like uh, Andy did anything? Do you know if he reamped your bass tracks? Uh, yeah, he, he does that kind of thing like a default. Anyway, I mean, that, oh, that, yeah. that, that, that's what he does. He loves yeah. doing stuff like that. And he'll take whatever you've given him and put it through base. You know, when, when you when you do what uh, Andy Sneak does, you know, you, you wake up, get a coffee, maybe watch a bit of TV, and then go into the studio, and it's just amps, cables, and his desk. Yeah, and he's got like uh, the bass files, the drum files, the guitar files, all at his fingers. All he needs to do is like say, "I'll send the signal that Nibs has sent me through that cable, plug it into that amp." Which might he's got a bass amp in his studio that he likes to use for me and for other bass players. Um, it's called a PV Fireball, and I think it's about an eight hundred watt solid state amplifier yeah and he uses that and he also likes to you know a typical classic heavy rock thing is like you get tube drive or like crunch overdrives and blend that kind of thing into your signal and that's the kind of thing you need sometimes in rock bass to be able to get a little bit of character in in sure. the soundscape you know there's so much uh, rock guitar going on in, in, in a band like Saxon or Iron Maiden uh, but just because there are so many guitarists you know there's two guitarists there's a lot of like uh, looking for space for the bass to be able to be like uh, having a present character and yeah. so frequency it's got to find places in the mix for the frequency of the bass to live yeah uh, Andy usually puts me through uh, PV5 or 800 um, and something maybe, you know, like a Billy, Billy Sheehan stomp box or something like that, mm. you know, just, uh, I think it, I think that's from EBS electric bass systems. I think it's a Swedish product. I'm not sure, but it's, uh, it's a stomp box. Call it a fuzz box. Yeah. 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 Fuzz box and an amp and I don't know. You can write to Andy. He'll tell you exactly what it was. And, uh, but, uh, I know that he likes the fireball for me and other bass players, and, and just a, a little bit of we call it teeth on top on top of it. Yeah, a little bit of bite. Yeah. And, uh, I'm getting back out of the rabbit hole though. That, that was in. There. Yeah, no, I love it. I love <laughs> yeah, it. That I, think that, I think I think the players. I'll just, a, I'll just grab a coffee. I'm just going over there. Yeah, that's okay. fine. Yeah, that's fine. I, I think it's cool that uh, that you know other players would hear that and go, oh yeah, you know, it's like. Yeah, surely, and, and surely our listeners, you know, uh, 
would like to, you know, hear gear stories about gear and right. You don't, you never know how the finished product got made. You know, it's you don't know how the sausage was made until you hear it from the man himself. You know, so that's yeah, that's I, interesting. You know, I think that I think that also there is something that, and Nibs can of course. Uh, agree or agree to disagree that Andy is probably one of the best uh, mixer slash hard rock creators uh, mm-hmm. around. Yeah, he's uh, done some great work lately. He, yeah, he is a, an amazing uh, his a natural ear for hard rock and metal, of course, because he's mixing thrash mm-hmm. metal uh, to classic rock. Basically, yeah. yeah. yeah so his well, carpe ear is DM- long. Carpe Diem has gotten uh, rave reviews across the board, and and I'm not surprised because I've told people that Saxon has been on a roll with the last four or five records. I, I think you've done amazing work this late in your career, and I, I put all of your recent four to five albums up against any of your best stuff from you know the Power and the Glory days, the Crusader days, things things around that time, and... Um, so I'm I'm happy to see that you guys are number one delivering a great album. We love it when our heroes continue to put out great stuff, and uh, that you're getting some of the accolades for that. Uh, but you really are on a streak right now. I think the last four or five albums have been great. Well, thanks. That's big, big compliments. Wow. And uh, I've just come back from church as well, so I'm feeling very humble. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you, you know, we were talking a little bit, this is kind of without going down the rabbit hole, because I don't think this question requires to go that deep, but I know that you're 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 a, a fingers player, but also a pick player. Um, tell us about your playing style and how you decide which song is fingers, which song is pick, or when you when you alternate between the two. It's a good question. Yeah, well, uh when you when you're on stage, uh and, and uh, it's not the studio, yeah? You, you've got the record hopefully recorded. It's sold out, thank, thank you. And uh, then you're on stage, and the idea is that you entertain. You know, it's we're that kind of band anyway. I mean, you get some bands that are really minimalist, and they just let the music speak for them. But we like to, like, make a bit of a, bit of a presentation on stage. And I, 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 I go for pretending that I'm a, a, like uh, the hop. It's the Friday night uh, school disco. Yeah. Yeah. Air, air guitar. Somebody smuggled in a tin of beer. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, so you just, you just go for it. Yeah. And yeah. if you're doing that with a plectrum, it can, it can like be a bit of a hindrance or a, a hindrance uh, because uh, a plectrum uh, player has, Got, got quite quite a thing to do. Um, you know, you you it's between you and the strings and your fingers, and you, you you've got to find a really good position. I, I just can't do it. I can, I can play plectrum. You know, basically, I use my fingers because I've always enjoyed playing with fingers. Uh, Geddy Lee was one of my main heroes. Phil Lynott was one of my heroes too. Ah, but, so uh, Phil Lynott's a plectrum player. Yes. Uh, and, um, but if you look at Phil Lynott, you see him some, in some super striking poses, yeah? But he's usually got the bass in such a comfortable position. I mean, even if it's here, he's got his hand right on the bass. Right. He's in that position for more than like half a second. He's usually there for like 10 seconds. Occasionally you'll see him moving around and jumping into a position, but then he'll stay there. And I I like to be able to like move all over the place. And that requires like being a little bit more out of control. And that's where I can use my fingers a lot better. If, if I decide, okay, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm fucked now. I just got to take it easy. Or the song is a little bit like uh, more steady or something where I can actually decide, okay, I'm going to stay here like Lemmy or like Phil Lennon. Then, then I'll pick up the plectrum. So you can get a uh, fast song, slow song. Some songs just feel more natural to play with the plectrum than, than, uh, than others. And I don't know. I mean, uh, 
it's I, feel not, like, I feel like it's, the, not, it's, the, not deter- it's not determined by the um, – it's mostly determined by how I feel on stage rather than what the technique requires. Got gotcha. yeah, you. I was going to say – I was going to say real steel with my fingers 90% of the time. Hmm. In fact, I'll probably start it with a plectrum and throw a plectrum away by the time you get into the singing part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was going to say, I was going to say, usually the the tone is slightly different, or depending on what the amp settings are, or yeah. whatever you're running through, the pick has all attack. You yeah, know, it's, right. it's a definite attack, and the fingers give a warmer feel, unless you've got fingernails and yeah, and I've, flat I've, wounds or something like that. The str- between the strings, the picks, and fingers, there's a lot of different tonalities that could happen, and it's usually more attack with pick, a little bit less with fingers. Yeah, well, I, I like to, I mean, uh, if we're getting technical, I'll just, I've got a bass, and um, if you're playing softly. Yeah. Yeah, like, like you say, you will get. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Different tone, yeah. Big difference. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. I do like to have a bit of a fingernail instead of just. Yeah. Yeah. So you can. And so that's that's, a fallback to basically loving uh, like John Entwistle and Geddy Lee. Yeah. 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 So there is a bit of fingernail in there. Yeah. He's That's where you can, get, you can get your attack with fingers and fingernail or attack with uh, – you just have to know what's going on. Obviously, Nibs knows exactly what's going yeah. on. You're yeah. also – I do in, weather forecasts as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, not even of uh, not even off topic, other than maybe the weather forecasting that you're excellent at. Apparently, is you are a bit of a. I didn't world. say I was any good. I just do it. <laughs> well, you, I was going to say you're you're you might as well be called tornado because I've seen you on stage a lot, and you are very active, and you do make well. Let's say Quinny, he's standing still. You're like running figure eights around him and Biff the whole show comparatively. That's just that's just how we like to do the gig, you know. I mean, it, sometimes it, it can appear that I'm a, a little bit o- overdoing it, but uh, I'd rather overdo something than underdo something with the kind of music that we're playing, you know. Sure. I'll, I'll take it easy, you know, on, on some tracks, but some tracks it just like, like it feels like it warrants some like additional expression. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, I. It, I'm well so, put. I'm glad that Jason uh, brought that up because I was going to ask you. Um, your stage presentation is is high energy would be an understatement. Um, so I was wondering, you know, as a musician, you've obviously got your your idols when it comes to uh, playing and performance, but as far as your stage presence did who were your head banging idols when you were growing up who put on the kind of show that you wanted to put on when you were a kid you said i want to perform like that guy angus young yeah hey, man. <laughs> that's what i hey, I, I knew hey, angus man. was going to be in the mix <laughs> yeah. yeah well the thing is uh i can remember going to the hop the 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 school disco and that was basically when would it have been? It would have been um, like the third year of comprehensive school. So I would have been, I don't know, 14. Yeah, 14. So it is. It's 1980. And uh, I don't think Back in Black was out yet. Oh, actually, no, in the lower school, mm-hmm. I remember Bon Scott died in the lower school. My goodness. And, mm-hmm. uh, 
I can remember riding in uh, on my bicycle, still in the dark in the morning. People were really freaking out. Bon Scott had died. And not, not long after, I can remember getting um, yeah my first singles, um, 747 Strangers in the Night and a whole lot of Rosie mm-hmm. uh, live from uh, If You Want Blood. And so, you know, we would go to the school disco and hope that they would play, you know, Whole Lot of Rosie or 747. And Whole Lot of Rosie just seemed to be a big deal for a lot of people because it's live, uh, that version. And it just seemed to be like a rallying call to air guitarists. Yeah. uh, To make their way to the center of the hall, please. (laughs) I didn't know what the hell I was shouting Angus for. I, I assumed it was some kind of like a Scottish like uh, call from this Scottish band or whatever. You know, just yeah, no, yeah, idea, no. no idea at all what was going on. And yeah. then basically, the, out of say twenty kids in the middle of the hall, there'd be like two or three who knew which model of their guitar they were going to play. Yeah. And I, I, the only thing I was aware of at home at that time was one of my brothers had a, a, a guitar, but you know, it didn't mean anything to me. Um, but I had, I was into tennis, so I had a tennis racket, yeah. and I had, I had my mum's uh, Tupperware. Yeah. <laughs> and stuff. Oh, I was pretty good with Tupperware. Yeah. I, I didn't have any symbols though, so I used to. My mum and dad used to have a fruit and veg, fruit and vegetable stall on the local market, and the, we'd gone from uh, imperial currency into decimal currency. So we had quite a lot of old uh, imperial coins lying around, big coins, and so I just made piles of them. They'd be my symbols. Wow, good idea. Yeah, well, I thought it was great, and I was like, blah, 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 blah. and if I was doing rush, I would have to like like depress the air out of the small. Like uh, Tupperware. Tupperware. So, you know, you've got to get uh, that crack. Yeah. I mean, if you're doing Neil Peart, you've got to have that. Yeah. And so I've run out of Tupperware, just like stuff falling off the bed. But I, the crowd loved it in my. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm doing the whole drum, you had drum, to tune, drum you, Learning how to tune the Tupperware <laughs> on the bed. Yeah. With Nibs Carter, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. That was better than my uh, weather forecasting. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you, uh, you've, uh, I think that the successes that you've had with Saxon kind of sort of come from your your schoolboy in your brain. The crowd was great, and guess what? Yeah. The crowd is great, and it was oh. great then, and it's great now. And yeah, the thing is, uh, that's what it's all about. I mean, it, it's show business in the end. I mean, somewhere in, in, along the way, you're writing. Uh, that's right. Music, expressing, you know, what your inspirations and like hopes and all that kind of um, background, fundaments of a song in that's rock. Right. You know the basic stuff, and then you you, you like add your own like uh, angles and stuff to it, keeping it in a classic format. And yeah, I think with this album, I think with the Carpe Diem album, it seems to be like pretty um, uh, um, a lot of feedback I've been getting is that the band have seems to have like kept it. Cla- classic and not put uh, when I'm writing riffs I, I love to do classic stuff but I also like to be a little bit diverse and add some like angles to it that aren't so like um, typical or traditional and that, that, that's that been apparent on like the last three or four albums and sometimes it can seem a little bit like uh where are they going with this? I'm not sure what this is. And sometimes, you know, we manage to keep it away, back, you know, bring it back on the road just in time before you think we're going completely uh, off the rails. And oh, but but this, this album, we, we, 
we've kept it pretty much on, on, on the straight and narrow right the way through. And, you know, we've delivered it with, uh, you know, the intention to be like, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't say competitive, relevant. I don't know. We, we, we've done it all our own way. But, you know, every now and then we remind you that, you know, we're, we're prepared to go this way. But uh, we've kept it pretty much more straightforward on this album. I think it's funny. People seem to, like, give you credit for staying, you know, within right. that. For doing yeah. the same thing again. Yeah. Well, yeah. people people I get comfortable, you know. Yeah. People like, I mean, you know, that was the the beauty of the Ramones and, and Motorhead and ACDC. And, you yeah. know, th- some people will say they've, they've done the same album 25 times and other people will say, I don't want them to do anything but that album. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You, I think that Saxon is, is an institution and you yeah, you shouldn't mess around with it basically. that's exactly right. right i love that it's it right. comes off a certain way the i think that lyrically you guys have been you know there's always a little bit of surprise but there's always that oh yeah well you know when i heard the record and the song you know battering ram that was that's perfect that even that sounds like saxon but it's also very it can be. It might even be in the were in the in the encyclopedia of Saxon. That's very common. That yeah. sounds like okay. Well, we're going to get to a song called you know. I don't want to say cliche, but that comfortable. Oh yeah, that sounds like a Saxon song. Yeah, yeah, I can't yeah. wait to hear that song. You know, kind yeah. of a thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's. And when when you've got those kind of titles as well, you know, already. Uh, in in the writer or basically if you know that those titles are around it, it's it's just a it spurs you on you know, like to i don't know uh, sometimes not you know we're only are only human sometimes you wake up in the morning you you don't have that intention or motivation to to do what you just said and like um play the same old mm. but with a different like uh you know, set of motivation. It's uh, it's not that simple to do that kind of thing. So it is good, like definitely good for Biff to have, um, you know, some titles, some like themes, you know, always there in, in, in his writing book, you know, so that when you're not sure what on earth is going on in your life or uh, – you know, you, you, you can pull out like your know, list of working titles or something. Yes. Like yes. Yeah. I uh, think that. Like, <clears throat> I it think might that the, a little bit like uh, uber methodical, but you know, it, it, it's it's priceless to have a bunch of stuff in your pocket uh, that you can refer to that comes from you. Yes. And. You know, you don't feel like you're searching through other, like, people's catalogs of music as inspiration. Now, you know, if you've got a bunch of your own stuff, it's really motivating uh, to pick your stuff up and think, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on stuff that I've come up with and I'm using it as my inspiration. You know, so it's, it's great to have themes, titles, riffs, rhythms, just always there as your uh, toolbox, so to speak. And I, I'm oh, a bit like to do that. And yeah, you say battering ram comes straight out of that toolbox, that kind of sacrifice, that, that kind of vital thunderbolt. And yeah. Yeah. All, all those albums that, in, like I said earlier, the, the albums in your recent past, the past four or five releases, I think are just fantastic. And, uh, anyone listening that hasn't kept up with Saxon in recent years, Jason's heard me say this before, you owe it to yourself to go rediscover Saxon because the material that's come out on the last four or five albums is really, really strong. That's and, a big uh, compliment. Big compliment. Uh, Thanks. You earned it, man. You earned it. I, I wouldn't be saying it if it wasn't true. I feel so, like knowing I feel like knowing what you're gonna get as a Saxon fan is important. And also you you can't be act so surprised because I feel like Saxon every once in a while has a surprise. It's not just the same, you know, it's not just motorcycle man on every album. You know, there's, 
you are going to have those there, but you're also going to have a little bit of surprise. Do you think that the song, every album has like one moment where it's not just, you know, uh, Seven Force, you know, the classic songs? Do you feel like there's a couple of songs on every album, as long as you've been in the band, that might have a bit of a twist? That you, yeah. That, yeah, I, I think so, too. Yes, de definitely. Um I mean, on this record, I, 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 I like to come up with what seems to be like a heavy riff and stuff like that, but I'll, I'll often drift off into a verse pattern that's not your typical. There's one track on this record called um, Supernatural on the, on the um, Carpe Diem album, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it begins with a heavy riff, but it's uh, it, 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 it's not as straightforward like a heavy rock drum groove though you know I, I, it's more of a it's got a bit of a funk groove to it but wow. when it drops in when it drops into the verse i mean it's a slow heavy thing bumps but cat bumps bumps cat bumps but cat but that's not typical heavy but if you take away any grooving that's going on there it's very close to denim and leather's tempo right. so it's got slow it's got slow heavy in its description yeah but it's but it's uh it's quite uh you know it's got funk in there as well and then but then when it drops into the verse uh it, it's got space of like um you know if, if i imagine something like eagle has landed mm -hmm. um I, I i used to really love those kind of like guitar figures that graham and paul would do in stuff like sailing to america well or, or just like uh yeah, that thing, that song is like, um, how does it go? But then it drops into. Mm. Yes. Yeah. That's it's that funky. sounds like Saxon to me. Yeah. Yeah. But it's got yeah. a it's got a funky element to it. Mm hmm. Yeah, cool. yeah. That 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 thing. The, the the opening riff is heavy, funky, but then it drops into that. Bam, bam, bam. Yeah. A lot of lot of space, a lot of room for vocals. A lot but of. Then room. it goes into a really. Uh, So it's a, it's a it's a funny old thing what it goes into and Andy treated that interesting. I had a can't remember what I was doing on the guitar now. There was some kind of all right around here. This is all like teaser stuff. Makes people want to go buy the record. Now. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on, see if you can hear that. Yeah. This is like la 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 la. But with all of the arpeggio notes that I was playing, Andy took the highest transients. I think you call it. Or the peaks of the waveform in, in in that guitar part, and he fed it into some kind of um, triggering system, and he was triggering uh, pizzicato oh, uh, spr yeah. strings, yeah, mm -hmm. and also I think he was even triggering some kind of uh, piano with what I was playing there, and that, that's that's actually on that track, which is a bit. Like wacky, but it fits because uh, Biff ended up singing it about an apparition, uh, a ghost apparition. Mm -hmm. it's, called La it's called Lady in Grey. Yeah, I thought it was called Supernatural. That was the working title, but it and it's really wacky. It goes into that. And you can hear this like, and it's all coming from. <laughs> No, yeah. like guide guitar, which is sure. uh, yeah. unorthodox. But that's you know that's that's what Andy's good at. Mm. He pulls pulls something out that you you wasn't expecting, but it enhances the track. 
clever stuff. Yeah. Well, and once again, uh, it proves what I was saying just about there being a few surprises on every record. Yeah, that, that's that's a, that's yeah, yeah. that's uh, not your typical Saxon track. But you know, um, I think Biff sings really well on that track, and uh, it's not your typical track. You know that that stands out as yeah, that's uh, not the expected like. Yeah. It's not Battering Ram or Motorcycle Man. or No. No, yeah. no there, there, there's no. not tempo heavy stuff on there. And that one's yeah. like. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. that one's in the private, like, so, uh, private room. So, Nibs, can tell us when, um, and our listeners too, when uh, you're going to get back on the road. Uh, if you have dates already listed, tell North us America. where they can find them. Yeah. Oh, uh, well. Uh, touring we've got autumn we've got some stuff but it's only okay. Europe at the moment Britain okay. and Europe but our festivals it's still on the uh, on the other side of the Atlantic I'm afraid um, yeah. we did have plans to come out to the to the states in like uh, April May but you know that was all planned six months ago things changed yeah. so I, I think uh, US is going to be Probably spring twenty three. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, we have listeners yeah. over the pond, so yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's de it's definitely not going to be if it, if it's going to be this year, I would be surprised. I I hope we get to the states this year, but uh, we had to pretty much move everything, like uh, either late this year or or spring next year, and so we've got festival dates in Europe. Uh, that begins in June. We've got like three or four in June. I think there's Poland, like Italy. Great. Uh, there's like uh, European festivals, June, July, August, basically. How and many then, How many tunes from Carpe Diem are, are in the set right now? We, we haven't come up with a set list yet. Oh. No. That, oh, that's fresh. Yeah, that's uh, – but usually, when we go out on tour nowadays, we usually like to put four or five from, oh. from a new, new record straight into the set list. And Sometimes that's that can be seen as maybe two or three more than normal for bands that tour out. Yeah, record. well, when we we the first dates we did on the Thunderbolt album were with Judas Priest, and we we were we were only uh, playing fifty minutes with judas yeah. priest yeah and we still played uh, we were we were at the san antonio show yep. for that <laughs> yeah as far as i remember we were playing uh, at least three even even in even in that set list you know we were playing the secret of flight thunderbolt oh. we played they played rock and roll right that's three in a 50 minute set yeah from, that's that's from that's, your that's, new album yeah right well that that, that's that goes that goes back to the point I was making earlier. You know, your last four or five tours have been in support of really strong albums, so you can actually get away with doing that. Yeah. A lot of a lot of people, a lot of fans would be disappointed that they're not getting. You know, four songs is taking up room that you know maybe two of the classics could have been included. But yeah. I think when you're coming out with a strong album like you have for the past four or five years, I welcome hearing the new stuff. You know, yeah. because. I've heard the classics before, and I want to hear them again. Don't get me wrong, but if you've got great new, strong material, then bring it on, man. And and you guys have you guys have done that. I think. I, uh, I think thanks for saying that. It, it's funny, you know, when you, when you've been doing it as long as Saxon have, sometimes you forget that people do like to hear your new stuff. You know, uh, people. Of course, we know people want to hear it, but. You, you can easily uh, fall into the uh, trap of saying, yeah, we've only, let's say it's our show, our tour, then you've usually got a couple of hours to fill. There's plenty of room for some new stuff, but, yeah, aren't they going to miss that classic song, that classic mm -hmm. song? Right. You know, Saxon brought out so many, like, great tracks in the first four years. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, fire in the sky. I, I always want to hear fire in the sky. Yeah, it's it's crazy. When 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 we we did like uh, about ten years ago, we did uh, 
12 years ago. We did like a 30th anniversary of Wheels of Steel. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We played the whole album. And after we played that whole album, it was like, I thought, my God, what must it have been like playing this album back in 1980? Yeah. yeah. And that's, if you, if you bump into bands, especially over in the States, you bump into bands that saw Saxon with Maiden and Fastway or something back, back in those days. Right here. So yep. My second concert. We, we were there. It, it, it didn't really matter how much he was in love with Maiden or, or, or Fastway. It, it, it's something to do with, uh, you know, that, that uh, Wheels of Steel album. It had so much, like, uh, real attacking uh, playing uh, uh, and uh, quite, quite a vicious attitude from Biff as well, you know. Yeah. You know, they weren't singing about uh, slaughtering uh, deaths in a big way, you know, but just stuff like street fighting gang. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, you know, closer closer to what I think Philip Linet would have written about in the old days, or yeah. or somebody like that. Classic, very British, uh, in my opinion, uh, sort of like little stories. It's working yeah. class, working yeah. class. Yes, thank yeah. you, Dave. Yeah, yeah. It, it is, and it's like when we did the album, and you know, obviously the focus from rehearsing and everything was right on the album, and it made me think, wow, oh. I know, I know what I need uh, as a template for writing for the next part of my life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you, you you can't go wrong modeling uh, future endeavors off of wheels uh, wheels of steel. Yeah, I, I, I must say, uh, I definitely did do since yeah since about twelve years ago. I, I thought, yeah. I tell this story a lot. Uh, it's been a little while since I've told it, but I actually met Saxon in nineteen eighty two. They were supporting Molly Hatchet, uh, oh, right. Austin, Texas. Hey, what a good night. It was, yeah. it was amazing. It was my, uh, it was March 17th, 1982. And I, oh, wow. it was my uh, birthday. Yes, yeah, my it's wife's the, birthday, my father's birthday, St. Patrick's Day. Wow. Mine, mine's oh. the 18th. Uh, uh -huh. So, you know, it's March 17th and I'm hanging out at, at Saxon's hotel uh -huh. and the clock strikes midnight and I'm like, what time is it? And I think Biff says it just turned midnight. And I said, well, right now is my birthday. Cheers, everybody. Yay. And wow, uh, it was a great, great night. And it's like one of those things in my, in my mind and in my yeah. sort of well, like. Many people have had a birthday like that. So, yeah. yeah, especially yeah. when they're an Uber fan, front row from Saxon, did the support group, yeah. didn't see a lick of the headliner because they found out where Saxon was playing, and oh. me and my friends crashed the party at the pools poolside, uh -huh. uh, and you know got all our shit autographed, and and it was fantastic, and it was the first time that I had met Nigel, and Nigel was fairly new. He had yeah, only played on Eagle fresh. Landed. He had, pretty fresh for Nigel. Yeah. Yeah. And uh and then fast forward, it was I got a big kick out of uh I car I was in in charge of card cartage of Nigel's drum kit to that show in San Antonio on the Thunderbolt tour. Oh, wow. I brought him his drum kit That's to cool. and from because you guys were flying over to South America that night. All right. Right. Yeah. Opening Nigel, when Nigel yeah. lived here, he was, uh, when, when Nigel lived here in Texas, uh, the, the last time I understand he's back now, he, he, he actually yeah, he moved back. messaged me and told me he's back in, in the Dallas area. But yeah. previous he was in the Austin area where I am, where Jason is. And he was about 20, 25 minutes from our house. So yeah. Lake, uh, Lake way. Yeah. Lake yeah, way. Exactly. Well, it's funny me and, um, at that particular show, the producer of our podcast here, uh, Jared Tutin, he, he went with me. He was with me. He went to Nigel's house, got the drum kit, drove to San Antonio, rocked the fuck out, loaded it up back in the truck yeah. and, and came <laughs> and, and took it back to his house. Uh, that was yeah. it. That's yeah, a good great pretty, pretty small, so, small world. I've also, yeah. I have to say this too, because uh, I'm a fanboy, but uh, in certain configurations of different bands that I've been in, I can say I've opened for Saxon. My bands have opened for Saxon wow. since the year 2000, like 
four or maybe five different pro of my projects have opened yeah. for Saxon. In okay. 2000, my band Watchtower was on the Bang Your Head Festival. It wasn't direct support or anything, but okay. Watchtower played Bang Your Head with Saxon in 2000. Um, but Evil United, Igniter, and uh, that's probably it. Three different last, bands that I both. Last time played. Saxon was in Austin, Igniter opened. That's right. So, yeah, that's and, still. And out. Nibs, you came up to me and you said it was Igniter that was opening. You came up to me during sound check and you said, "Whatever happened to?" I won't do your accent. Whatever happened to Evil United? And I was like, <laughs> "You remember that?" So yeah. <laughs> well. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I'm congratulations on Carpe Diem. It's a great record. And, I, and I'm Cheers. hoping that I'm hoping that COVID is settling down enough that you guys can actually uh, plan a tour and, and have it become reality. I know you've been planning tours and they all get thrown in the trash because of, you know, COVID or whatever. But here's to returning to some normalcy. Here's to a great new album from Saxon. Uh, here's to some potential uh, North American dates so we can see you in person again, see you live on stage where we always have a great time. And uh, as for today, just thank you so much for joining us, Nibs. It was a this real pleasure talking fantastic. to you. Fantastic. Yeah, I love Jason, it so much. Jason, thank you. Jason, Dave, yeah, let's, let's uh, fingers crossed that this thing like uh, gets under control and everybody can get back out and uh, get back on the road again. Because we, we've got it good, you know, we're, we're an established band, but there are loads of bands out there that are trying to do what we're doing, like uh, releasing a record and go out and tour. And if you can't tour, you know, some bands can't even get off the ground with their first album, you know. So, right. Great point. Yeah. yeah. Great fingers point. Fingers crossed. Well, thanks again for a great album, and thanks again for joining us today. On behalf of my co-host, Jason McMaster, I'm Metal Dave, and special thanks to our guest, Nibs Carter from the Mighty Saxon. Thank you all for listening to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast. Awesome.